Hi guys, I found this cool video. Posted a few weeks posted a few weeks ago. It's pretty cool. I watched it like a few times. Really wanted to show you it. That seems cool too. Here. I wanna show you it. I haven't really fully watched it. It's a perfect day for a wedding. On a warm spring afternoon, a bride and a handsome groom it's are exchanging the special rings they had custom designed and made for each other. As they take turns placing the rings on each other's fingers, a man standing at the end of the wedding party steps out of position. He approaches the groomsman next to him and reaches into his jacket, taking out a pair of pliers that he hands to the groomsman. The groomsman happily takes the tool the, uh, and the then, without any in. hesitation, shoves the pliers into his mouth and begins removing his teeth one by one. When he is finished, he hands the bloody teeth to the man along with the pliers. The man then goes to the next groomsman who repeats the same process. He continues going down the line until all of the groomsmen and bridesmaids have removed their teeth, seemingly without pain or resistance. The man then approaches the bride and groom. He hands each of them half of the pile of teeth, which they gladly accept. They then begin to eat the teeth without delay, seemingly not bothered by the intense damage they're causing to their own teeth and jaws by doing so. The man watches as the groom moves the priest who is officiating the wedding aside. As the entire church looks on in joy, the groom opens his mouth as I told and the you, deafening sound of cicadas are heard. This is only the beginning of what the SCP Foundation has labeled an SCP-2852 event, a terrifying and little understood phenomenon that is better known by the nickname of the anomalous creature responsible for them, Cousin Johnny. The Foundation had been trying to contain Cousin Johnny for decades, not that it ever done them any good. Johnny is a Keter-class anomaly that's thus far proven impossible to contain. This is an entity so dangerous and volatile that three different mobile task forces are devoted to detecting and disrupting its activities. MTF Upsilon 36, aka the Party Crashers, MTF Upsilon 52, aka Cater Duty, and MTF Upsilon 99, aka the Altar Boys. But so far, all the Foundation has been able to really do is swoop in afterwards and do their best to pick up the pieces of people's shattered lives. Cousin Johnny has so far been observed to only operate in the North American subcontinent and only seems to appear at Anglican or Catholic baptisms, weddings, and funerals. However, Foundation operatives charged with keeping a lid on Cousin Johnny harbor the hidden fear that he may one day expand his hunting grounds and wreak terror worldwide. If Johnny becomes became multinational or multi-denominational, his violence, insanity, and pure evil may truly become impossible to minimize. So compatible communities are constantly monitored for increased levels of juvenile delinquency, sterility, domestic violence, and divorce. After all this, you're probably wondering, who or what actually is Cousin Johnny? And how does he cause so much horrific tragedy? At face value, nothing about the appearance of Cousin Johnny would suggest an anomalous nature, or even any sort of danger. He appears to be a middle-aged white male, often with scruffy hair and a beard. On a cellular level too, Cousin Johnny appears all too human, but when you look at his physiology, it's a whole different story. Cousin Johnny has no identifiable organs whatsoever. His body is made out of a fibrous muscular tissue. The only exceptions are his teeth and hair, which are made out of a kind of chitin, a key component of insect exoskeletons, such as those possessed by cicadas. Johnny's eyes are the first clue that something is off about him. From a distance, they appear perfectly normal, but up close, they're glassy and dead. This is because his eyes aren't actually attached to any nerves inside his head. With no nervous system or vocal cords, Johnny's ability to see, move, and talk defy any kind of logical explanation. His speech will seem completely normal to the people under his spell, but to anyone else, it comes out as complete nonsense, often described as word salad. If people in attendance are briefed in advance about this phenomenon, whatever hypnotic ability causes them to hear his sounds as intelligible words won't work, and they'll be aware of how nonsensical it all sounds. But of course, that doesn't mean they're safe. Cousin Johnny appears at family gatherings and religious rituals, and immediately he'll be treated as though he's always been there. You know your cousin Johnny, right? You go way back. 
or at least you're pretty sure you do, nothing will appear unnatural about his sudden presence. In fact, if you're one of the victims of one of his incidents, chances are you'll actually find yourself taking a shine to Cousin Johnny. Sure, his sense of humor is a little crude and raunchy, but you can't help but enjoy his company. He's a fun guy to be around, and after all, he's family. As previously mentioned, he'll only appear at three different kinds of events, baptisms, weddings, and funerals, and only those that are affiliated with either the Catholic or Anglican religions. The SCP Foundation has classified baptisms that Cousin Johnny attends as blue-level events. Weddings are known as white level events, and funerals are black level events, with each one escalating in severity, violence, and horror. First, baptisms, the blue level events. In these events, Cousin Johnny will appear and begin to act as a third godparent, despite there traditionally only being two. As the infant is lowered into the holy water, the entirety of their top layer of skin will come off like a molting snake. Despite looking horrific, this apparently causes no harm to the child. The godparents will then eat this discarded skin as though it's the most normal thing in the world. After this, the family will leave the church together, and Cousin Johnny will leave with them. He won't appear at any subsequent celebrations of the child's baptism. Of course, this is just the beginning of the terror. Following Cousin Johnny's appearance at the baptism, the child's risk of dying in the next six months skyrockets, and if they survive, they're at an increased risk of becoming unstable and violent later on in life. Their parents and godparents will both become unable to conceive any further children and are likely to be found dead from drowning within five years of the event. Those who are only tangentially involved in the baptism ritual have a massively increased chance of failed pregnancies, or if they do conceive, they may become a danger to their offspring. Children who live through blue level events and survive past adolescence will experience adverse side effects when encountering the songs of cicadas well into adulthood, from experiencing physical sickness to going through dangerous psychotic episodes. Weddings or white level events are more complex and severe. In this case, Cousin Johnny will insert himself into the wedding as a groomsman, and the most horrifying events will begin to take place after the vows have been exchanged. Johnny will provide various implements that allow the bridesmaids and groomsmen to remove their teeth, which are then given to the bride and groom to eat, which they do, causing severe damage to their own teeth in the process. The groom will then vocalize an unknown cicada call at an incredible volume, as loud as 140 decibels in some instances, rendering the bride and everyone else near the altar completely deaf. At the wedding reception, where everyone is continuing to behave as if nothing out of the ordinary is happening, Cousin Johnny will ruin things farther by giving the best man speech. The speech is more of his typical complete nonsense, though if you're there you'll never realize this and think that this is the best speech you've ever heard with some in the audience laughing hysterically while others cry uncontrollably. Once his speech is done, he'll present a gift to the newly married couple, 3.5 kilograms of human hair in various colors, 13 deceased specimens of a certain cicada known as Linnae's cicada, and 23 human teeth in a cardboard box. Only Verizon gives you more of the best. 5G from America's most reliable network. That's more plans disturbing. you can mix and match yeah. and save. More of the entertainment you Not love. This. And the phone you want on us. <laughs> all starting at just $35. Only from Verizon. DNA tests on all the gifts have been inconclusive as to their origin. Much like many celebrity marriages, unions that occurred during white level events never last and all end up divorced within two years, often as a result of domestic violence, and any children born during their brief marriage will be violent and unstable. But it's not just the wedding party that gets to experience the fun of a visit from Cousin Johnny. All married individuals who attended the wedding will find that they are unable to conceive children, despite no biological indicators of infertility. Any children present at the white level event will show no interest in romance throughout their life, and often die tragically before reaching the age age of 18. Finally, and most horrifying of all, are funerals, or black level events. While blue and white level events can potentially be disrupted before they are completed, lessening or preventing the horrific results, there is as yet no way to stop or prevent a black level event at any stage. Any attempts to prevent Cousin Johnny from entering the church or funeral home will lead him to simply manifesting inside. 
Once in the room where the funeral is taking place, Cousin Johnny will first take up the role of eulogizer and begin speaking his standard nonsense to the attendants. The person who was emotionally closest to the departed will then open the casket, if this was not already an open casket funeral, and will then produce a large knife. It's unknown where the knives come from, as they're not present before the event and they disappear after. The funeral attendees will then use the knife on their wrists and sometimes throats, draining their blood into the coffin. Many lose more than enough blood to result in death, but none ever die from this, nor do they seem to feel any pain from their wounds. As the attendees take turns bleeding into the coffin, Cousin Johnny continues his eulogy which eventually evolves into a cicada song, the kind sung by Linnae's cicada males. The attendants sing the same song back to him in a kind of call and response. Cousin Johnny will then approach the coffin and vomit in a mixture of blood, wood pulp, and dead cicadas. The funeral will then proceed as normal, and the blood, vomit, and cicada-filled casket is then taken to the cemetery and buried. Black level events will usually end with the body being interred in the ground, but if there's a wake after the funeral, the horrors of the black level event will continue. At the wake, Cousin Johnny will climb on top of a table, lie down and encourage the other attendants to devour him, which they do. All the while he continues to talk his nonsense, until there is nothing left. Much like blue and white level events, being in attendance leads to horrific after effects. All participants who experience this event will separate from their family through either suicide, moving, or divorce. Every individual present at the event will also find that they are no longer able to produce offspring, and couples' presence may also fall victim to incidences of domestic violence, often involving cannibalism, that usually leave one or both participants dead. While well, six out of ten children involved will attempt to murder one or both of their parents before they turn 18. These black level events are so horrible for all involved that any members of the specialized Cousin Johnny mobile task forces that happen to witness such an event are treated with class A amnestics before they are transferred to another task force or retire to ensure that they don't have to live with the memories of what they saw. Prior to that, they are closely monitored for any strange or antisocial behavior to make sure they weren't affected by the event. And they aren't the only SCP Foundation staff at risk of having been impacted by Cousin Johnny. It is theorized that as many as a third of Catholic and Anglican D-Class personnel were involved in the Black Level event at some point and were driven to madness and violence by their fateful brushes with the strange relative that no one knows. So next time you're at a baptism, or a wedding or a funeral. Stay vigilant, keep an eye on the other guests, and always ask yourself, do you really have a Cousin Johnny? But since you're here, go check out SCP-3001 Red Reality and SCP-4205. All right, everyone, listen up, because I'm about to show you how to find new people to play with on Among Us. All you have to do is download the app Tia. This app matches you up with people who are also looking for Among Us lobbies. And the great thing about it goes without saying that the SCP Foundation archives are filled with some terrifying monsters. Never heard Even the deadliest creatures before. can, in theory, be defeated, or at least soundly avoided. After all, they're just flesh and blood, or in some cases, metal or concrete. But what if reality as you know it one day just broke? Or worse, you were transported to a reality so frightening and alien to our own that death seemed like the only escape. But you couldn't even give yourself that. This brings us to today's topic, the terrifying alternate reality of SCP-3001. The Foundation is no stranger to freaky alternate dimensions, but what was experienced by joint lead researcher Dr. Robert Scranton at Site 120 is a truly unique nightmare. Co-managed by his wife, Dr. Anna Lamb, Site-120 is a facility largely designated for research into SCPs with dangerous reality warping capabilities in order to mitigate future containment breaches. Reality warpers are among some of the more perplexing and dangerous SCPs, from the pocket dimension creating SCP-106 to the SCP creating Dr. Wondertainment and everything in between. Scranton and Lang's goal to further study such entities was an admirable one, if a little overambitious. And on January 2, 2000, during the testing of a new technology created by the Foundation's leading power couple, disaster finally struck. Scranton and Lang had already been the brains behind one of the Foundation's most valuable tools in the fight against reality-bending SCPs. 
the Scranton Reality Anchors. Their follow-up, the Lang Scranton Stabilizer, or LSS, likely would have been an even more advanced variant of their earlier invention and should have been a huge success for the team. But things didn't turn out that way. Dr. Scranton and several other researchers were gathered in Reality Lab A performing routine tests on the LSS prototypes. While other technicians ran diagnostics tests, Scranton stood at the control panel, the blinking red light above the console confirming that everything was going according to plan. But as anyone who's fallen victim to one of the Foundation's many anomalies will tell you, just because you've done everything correctly doesn't mean you're safe. Scranton began operating the machine, not knowing that something was rumbling up towards him from below. Without warning, a sudden, unexpected burst of seismic activity rocked the entire bay. Base. Researchers grabbed onto whatever was closest as the world shook around them. In this panic, Dr. Scranton clung to the LSS control panel as the seismic blast fried the circuits and kicked it into overdrive. There was a blast of magnificent blinding light, and when the rumbling stopped, not only was the doctor gone, he had been erased from reality as we know it. The earthquake had caused a deadly malfunction in the machine meant to stabilize reality, and instead tore a rift in it, dragging the unfortunate doctor and the control panel into oblivion. His wife, Dr. Lang, and the many researchers who idolized him were devastated by his unexpected demise at the hand of what should have been his crowning achievement. The one silver lining was that this reality-ripping event had almost definitely eliminated the doctor quickly and painlessly. As far as the Foundation and his loved ones were concerned, Scranton's death had been immediate and complete, a luxury afforded to few Foundation employees who die anomalous deaths. But sadly, that isn't how Dr. Scranton's story, or the story of SCP-3001, ends. No, this is where it all begins. Really? How do we know all this? In the hellish new place where Scranton had been transported, the control panel from the LSS that he'd been clinging to for dear life had been transported with him and continued to record audio data from this anomalous location. Not that Dr. Scranton realized it. Not at first, anyway. As far as he knew, he'd suddenly been transported into a pitch black location. No sights, no sounds, no sense true nothingness. At first, the doctor was confused. One second he was testing out his new technology, and the next he was quite literally nowhere. In spite of his current situation, the doctor was still an intelligent and rational man. He took a moment to compose himself, hoping that in time his eyes would adjust to the new darkness around him. But that moment never came. The darkness remained perfectly absolute. Much like the darkness in another reality-defying SCP, the deadly endless staircase known as SCP-087, the dark seemed thick, almost like you could touch it. The doctor, not wanting to give himself to despair and die in this impossible place, and with no other options seemingly available, began walking. Either he'd find his way out, or the Foundation would find him. No need to panic. It may have altered the doctor's temperament if he knew that the Foundation already assumed he was dead and that no search party was going to come looking for him. Still, logic dictates that if a person walks for long enough, they're bound to find something. The problem Scranton was about to face was that SCP-3001 doesn't run by any kind of conventional logic. Get the best internet for your business and the best price for your budget. He walked and walked and walked, but he didn't seem to get any nearer to or farther from anything. But how could he even know? After all, in total darkness, there aren't any landmarks to assist in navigation. The doctor walked and paced and screamed for days on end, but he made no progress. He was alone in an empty world. He had no choice though, so he kept walking and walking and walking for 11 days. During that time, he felt his hunger and thirst grow. He was in terrible pain from a mix of starvation and dehydration, but the release of death didn't seem to come for him. He was going to have to learn the rules of this new place the hard way, and it grimly dawned on Dr. Scranton that dying in this place might not even be the worst possible outcome. He paced and repeated facts to himself, hoping to ground himself in the moment and avoid the panic that could so easily set in. Name, Robert Scranton. Age 39. Birthday, September 19th, 1961. Favorite color, blue. Favorite song, Living on a Prayer. Wife, Anna. 
Little by little, the words seemed to turn to nonsense in his mouth as the terror grew. Just as he felt like he was about to lose his mind, he noticed something, a small oasis in the endless darkness of SCP-3001, the glowing red light on the LSS control panel. Where had it come from? And how was it still recording? The doctor had no idea, but he was grateful for any kind of familiarity in the strange darkness around him. Perhaps the LSS could be the key to saving him, or at least figuring out what on earth was going on here. Whatever the case, there was no denying that having the panel here was better than nothing. At least, when it was found, if it was ever found, then people would know what had happened to him. As the days passed and he continued to mysteriously survive, Dr. Scranton deduced that one didn't need food or water to survive continually in SCP-3001. The location had an anomalous effect on its inhabitants. As the days passed and turned to weeks of wandering in the darkness, Dr. Scranton further deduced that he was no longer in his home dimension. This was an entirely separate pocket dimension, much like the one possessed by SCP-106, but featureless, a perfect self-contained void. Now dimly illuminated by the red light of the panel, Dr. Scranton explored further into the void around him. He traveled for months on end, the pain of his deficiencies growing by the day, but found he was getting nowhere. All things considered, he wasn't even sure he was moving, or whether reality and darkness were swirling around him like a thick liquid. Rather than walking on a single flat surface, he was moving in all directions across a three-dimensional plane. The space-time continuum appeared to be entirely broken here, where movement is more defined by the conscious intention to move than any real geographical repositioning. Dr. Scranton knew that this place broke every single one of Kijel's laws of reality parameters, and from his years working with a plethora of reality warpers in Site-120, he had a theory for why this pocket dimension was so strange. It had an extraordinarily weak Hume field. Before we get back to Dr. Scranton's semi-living nightmare, we need a quick primer on Hume theory and why having a weak Hume field is such a problem. A Hume is a unit of measurement for the strength and amount of reality in a given location or being. In an area with an incredibly low Hume field relative to our world, such as SCP-3001, universe breaches and anomalous incidents rise significantly. At the time of his being trapped there, SCP-3001 had the lowest number of Humes in any recorded environment, making it a phenomenally anomalous zone. It was for this reason that starvation and dehydration never took hold of him despite causing him great pain. And the worst by far was yet to come. Dr. Scranton wasn't trapped in this dimension for weeks or even months. He was trapped in the darkness for years, and it took a nightmarish toll on his body and mind. The small flashing red light on his LSS control panel became his only friend, and as the years drew on, he would hold entire conversations with his only source of illumination. He knew that his days were numbered. If he didn't escape the dimension within around three years, the Hume field would diffuse further, and he would be left in a truly horrific state. But based on how little headway he'd made in the time he'd been there, he didn't feel optimistic. He kept speaking into the recorder, if only to break the silence and prevent him from going completely insane. But even that would only hold it off for so long. Alone and talking to himself endlessly in the darkness, Dr. Scranton could feel his mind slipping as the confines of the pocket dimension constricted and his body began to change. The low Hume field slowly diffused his physical matter, destroying the physical integrity of his body, but never being merciful enough to actually let him die. In his haunting audio logs, the doctor described his hands as diffusing and thinning out like spider webs. Over time, there was less and less of him, and what was left wasn't entirely human. As Scranton's Hume level lowered to equalize with that of SCP-3001, the lines between his body and the LSS control console began to blur in a twisted marriage of warped flesh and machine. The Lang Scranton stabilizer was anything but stable. Before his mind and body became something else entirely, the doctor still had the presence of mind to finally realize how he'd come to be in this terrible place. The LSS had opened a wormhole known as a Class C broken entry into a paradoxical pocket dimension between layers of reality and taken him through it. He'd slipped through a crack in reality into absolute darkness, and now he was stuck with a fate far worse than death. How do we know any of this? Much like the event in the first place, it's a total accident. Testing superior reality bending technology almost six years after the disappearance caused the sudden return of the missing LSS to Site-120's reality labs. 
and the only trace of Dr. Scranton that it brought back with it was the blood and viscera that coated the console, much to the abject horror of his still grieving wife, Dr. Anna Lang. To this day, Dr. Scranton, formerly one of the Foundation's brightest minds, remains trapped in the nightmare of SCP-3001. His current condition, whether the doctor is still alive after 20 years of being warped by the low hume field of 3001's darkened confines, is still unknown. But for the doctor's own sake, we hope he's been dead for quite some time, because few things on Earth are as horrifying as the alternative. It's a quiet evening at Area 11 where the Pietrakal Fontaine Spatial Stabilization Array is housed. A skeleton crew is working overnight to ensure the array is ready for its big test the what following all day. The Foundation has been working on a particle accelerator that will contain anomalies with the ability to manipulate the nature of space-time. The preliminary tests seem promising, but a few last-minute tweaks to the array are necessary. Unfortunately, it is on this night in 1982 that marks the beginning of the end for the SCP Foundation. Dr. Calvin Desmond is monitoring the array, and he notices as it spools up that there are some minor power fluctuation in one of the stabilization arms. This problem is not uncommon, due to the vast amounts of energy being pumped through the array and the harmonic resonance the machine gives off, which slowly causes the coupling rings to loosen. Calvin Desmond decides that remounting the stabilization rings will be an easy fix, and it's a necessary one. He knows that if the rings fail during the actual test, the array could end up shut down for months. There is still plenty of time, so Calvin Desmond grabs his toolbox and heads down to the array. The machine is still spooling, keeping the energy flowing at a constant low rate. There is no danger at the moment, as the inside of the array is shielded from the radiation and energy pulsing through the outer ring. But then, something unexpected happens. The system's primary generator begins to fluctuate uncontrollably. A catastrophic failure is imminent. Sirens begin to sound, the facility is evacuated, and the chamber is sealed. Deep in the bowels of the array, Calvin Desmond cannot hear the evacuation announcement. The humming of the array echoes through the chamber, dampening all sound from the outside world. The array begins to come online while Desmond continues to work on the coupling. He has no idea what is about to happen. Meanwhile, a team of Foundation scientists scramble to get the power fluctuations in the main generator under control. As they frantically work, catastrophe strikes. They initiate the power down cycle, but as the generator struggles to keep the power flow balanced, an energy surge builds up. A massive amount of energy is released all at once, causing the main reactor to explode. The entire structure rocks back and forth, and Desmond is thrown into the side of the array. He too now knows that something is very wrong, and runs for the exit. When he reaches the door, he finds that it has been sealed. In a panic, Desmond continues running through the tube to the next access point. This door has been locked as well. He's never been so scared in his entire life, and he shakes uncontrollably from the adrenaline being dumped into his muscles. The surge of energy rushes through the array towards Desmond. A singularity begins to form in the containment chamber. The array is working just as it should, except that there was never supposed to be a person inside as the singularity was brought into existence. Moments after the singularity forms, the massive pull of its gravity causes the stabilizer arm that Desmond had been working on to fail. The side of the array is ripped off, and Calvin Desmond stares into the naked eye of the singularity. Everything is silent and still for a moment. Then the singularity collapses in on itself, taking the test chamber and much of the research wing with it, along with Dr. Calvin Desmond. Sparking wires hang from the exposed walls and ceiling where the singularity rips the main structure away. Water flows into the deep hole carved out of the earth where the array once stood. The scientists from Area 11 look into the crater left by the collapsed singularity. The Foundation administration sends agents to collect the staff at the site and document the failings of the project. They conclude that the accident was caused by human error. They order the array to be rebuilt, this time using entirely automated systems to eliminate the chances of another mishap occurring. 
Several years after the catastrophic events at Area 11, a new array is constructed. An intelligence system called NETSAC is put in charge of overseeing its functions. It is a supercomputer that is programmed to follow commands, but can autonomously make decisions in order to prevent any failures in the system. Experiments begin again in May of 2006. The new array soon manifests its first singularity in the containment chamber at Area 11, and what happens next will forever change the Foundation and the multiverse. The singularity is kept stable in the array. It seems as if the Foundation has succeeded in trapping and containing spatial anomalies. But as they run more diagnostics on the anomaly, something unexpected happens. The singularity begins to grow in size. The point of infinite gravity threatens to breach containment as it reaches the boundaries of the array. Just before contact, the singularity's growth slows and then stops. Netzak has made the split-second calculations and adjustments necessary to contain the singularity. The artificial intelligence has saved the facility and the lives of everyone in it. Now, sitting in the array, is a thick, rotating cloud of radioactive gas and dust, obscuring the singularity within. As Foundation scientists work rapidly to fix the array, odd events begin to occur. The workers hear noises that sound like painful wailing. Over time, the noises evolve into words, and then full sentences. They seem to be originating from the singularity. Using equipment able to penetrate the thick cloud of radioactive gas, the Foundation scientists get a glimpse at the singularity. To their surprise, the singularity has taken on the shape of a human. The scientists work frantically to figure out how the singularity could have formed itself into a humanoid shape. Dr. J. Barton Ramsey is the first to try and make contact with the humanoid within the singularity. He finds that the entity cannot communicate in the traditional sense. The massive gravitational pull of the singularity does not allow sound to escape its void. Instead, the entity manipulates gravity to vibrate the suspension rings of the array itself and create sound waves. The being in the singularity whispers in a metallic voice created by the vibrating of the array's rings and says, Johannes Ramsey. Dr. Ramsey steps back from the observation window. How do you know my name? He asks the entity. The humanoid within the swirling gas cloud identifies itself as having the memories of Calvin Desmond. It is not Desmond per se. The being in the singularity is so much more than one person. But it was somehow created by the accident that had sucked Calvin Desmond into the singularity years before. The entity seems to switch between the mind of Desmond and the vast infinity of the cosmos. The Desmond entity asks for an overseer from the Foundation to be brought in. It has a proposal for the O5 Council. When Dr. Ramsey asks why the entity needs to talk to the overseers, it replies that it wants to offer them a way out. The following day, O51 enters the facility and heads to the observation deck. He looks through the reinforced glass at the swirling cloud of radioactive dust, then glances at the monitor to see the humanoid shape of the singularity within. He presses the microphone button on the console and addresses the entity. To whom am I speaking? He asks. For simplicity's sake, the entity tells O5-1 to refer to him as Calvin Desmond. O5-1 makes notes of the events unfolding before him, and then asks about the way out that Calvin had mentioned. The air is still for a moment. Then, Desmond begins to speak through the vibration of the structure once again. He informs O5-1 that what the SCP Foundation is doing, by securing and containing anomalous entities around the world, is like putting a small band-aid on a much bigger wound. Desmond wants to propose a final solution to all of the Foundation's problems. O5-1 listens intently as the entity unravels the mysteries of where the SCPs have come from. He explains that the anomalies that the Foundation has worked so hard to secure, contain, and protect the human race from are actually bleeding into their reality from a vast multiverse. The only way to stop the manifestation of anomalies into this universe is to destroy all other realities. The entity that is Calvin Desmond tells O5-1 that he is able to bring about this destruction 
if they release him from the confines of the array. O5-1 is transfixed by the swirling gas that is promising him and everyone else on Earth salvation. He shakes his head in disbelief. Could this be true? O5-1 turns away from the swirling gas and begins to walk away from the viewing glass. I'll need to think about what you're saying. The structure begins to shake slightly. The voice of Calvin Desmond reverberates off of the array a little louder than before. Choose quickly, Overseer. Although it won't happen for decades, eventually a catastrophic SCP event will wipe out life on this planet. Perhaps not in your lifetime, but it will most certainly happen within the lifetime of your children. We will talk again soon. The vibrations slow and then stop completely. There is an eerie stillness in the observation room as O5-1 walks out. The next day, all staff members located at Area 11 are relocated to other Foundation sites and given amnestics. The O5 Council meets in a large circular room with wood paneling and no windows. O5-1 begins the meeting by telling the others what Calvin Desmond had described about the end of the world. He pauses for what seems like an eternity and tells them of Desmond's offer that he could prevent the end of the world, but at the cost of destroying an infinite number of other realities. This would mean that all the humans and creatures of those realities would be destroyed as well. Was murdering countless other beings worth it to protect their own reality? O5-1 begins to shake. He hasn't slept or eaten anything since his talk with Desmond. He's being torn apart from the inside. O5-3 stands up and addresses the council. He informs everyone in the room that independent teams have concluded research into what the Calvin Desmond entity has claimed, and they found it to be true. The world really would come to an end. Furthermore, the research teams determined that the capabilities of Desmond would in fact allow him to dismantle the other realities. O5-3 insists that the council must vote to allow Desmond to destroy the other realities to ensure that this reality could be saved. They must strike now before the world is overrun. O5-1 continues to shake while O5-3 breathes heavily, sweat pouring down his temples. The rest of the council shifts their gazes from side to side. It is time for a vote. There are eight eyes to allow Desmond to destroy all of the realities and four nays against the plan. O5-3 stands up and walks around the room, stopping behind each nay voter and putting a bullet in their head. He stops at the last, O5-9, who pulls out a gun, places it under her own chin, and pulls the trigger. O5-13 abstains from the vote and the measure passes. The remaining overseers will use the Calvin Desmond entity to save the reality at the expense of all others, and they soon head to Area 11 to execute their plan. O5-1, 4, and 12 enter the observation room that looks upon the swirling radioactive gas around Why Calvin Desmond. White? O5-1 orders Netzak to begin powering down the array, which will allow the entity to prove he can do what he has promised. They have pinpointed the reality that SCP-884 came from, and the shaving mirror itself sits on a table in another room in the facility. O5-3 stands in the room, watching the mirror to see if anything happens. O5-1 asks Calvin Desmond to eliminate the reality that the mirror had come from. The room shakes as the entity uses it to acknowledge the request. Moments later, the phone rings in the observation room. It is O5-3. He informs the others that the mirror has disappeared. Its reality has been destroyed, and therefore, it no longer exists. There is a sigh of relief in the room as the overseers realize that this just might work. O5-1 asks Calvin Desmond to continue and destroy all the realities that are bleeding into their own. This time, the entire facility begins to quake. Suddenly, O5-1 jerks backwards. His eyes wide in confusion and horror. His body seems to be compressing under an unknown force. 
O5-1 begins to distort. His legs and arms fold into the core of his body. His head snaps down, and all that was O5-1 is sucked down into a single point in space before it completely disappears. Calvin Desmond then turns his attention to the other two overseers in the room, who both seem to collapse into black holes of their own in the center of their bodies. Netzak's warning klaxon begins to sound, signaling that the emergency failsafe has been activated. Before Calvin Desmond is brought under control, the structural support in the entire facility vibrates with his words. They are in a voice that sounds strangely similar to O51's. Your children are free to live lives that do not end in horror. An end to your perpetual struggle. An end to darkness. The freedom to live in the light. All traces must be removed. This world must be washed clean. The Foundation does not escape atonement. It is the only way out. It had been a deception. The Calvin Desmond entity had no intention of stopping anomalies from infiltrating this world. It wanted to remove all traces of the anomalies from all universes, including this one. And that meant destroying the Overseers and the Foundation itself. Their destruction would serve as an atonement for the pain and suffering they had caused in their quest to secure and contain the anomalous. Calvin had to lie to the overseers about the real plan, since he knew they'd never sacrifice themselves and the Foundation, even if it meant an end to the anomalies plaguing our world. Now though, with the overseers out of the way, the Calvin Desmond entity is free to move forward with its plan and purge all realities of any trace of the anomalous. But just then, Netzak's failsafes kick in and the Petrakal Fountain Spatial Stabilization Array subdues the entity's abilities. Desmet is once again contained. O5-3 bursts through the door and into the observation room. He stands before the shattered glass of the window that looks into the array. O53 asks Netzak how long the containment array can hold Calvin Desmet. The computer's voice fades in and out, but says, Given current conditions, 119 days, 6 hours, and 47 minutes. <laughs> O5-3 size. He tells Netzak to make a note in the SCP database that the Calvin Desmond entity will now be known as SCP-001. Then to make dozens of other randomly generated entries and label them as SCP-001 as well. He knows that they will need to keep the true nature of what this entity can do a secret. O5-3 walks out of the room. Under his breath, he speaks to himself. They'll say that I'll know the one true God when I see it, and to give that God everything it wants, because that's the only thing that matters. Tonight, it appears God wants to talk to me. Now go watch the other SCP-001 proposals, The Children and The Church of the Broken God, for more from the most secret and sensitive files in the SCP Foundation's database. On a cold October night in 2003, Shirley Yates of Seattle, Washington was just about to get ready for bed when she heard a knock at the door. She approached the door and asked the person on the other side to identify themselves. The voice outside responded immediately. It was a salesman who just wanted a few moments of Mrs. Yates' time. This was odd for two reasons. First, it was almost 10 o'clock at night, much later than is usual for door-to-door -door salesmen. And second, the knock hadn't come from Mrs. Yates' front door. It was coming from the door to her bathroom. Has your home ever been visited by a door-to-door -door salesman? If you were born in the last 40 years, then your answer to that question is probably no. In the age of online shopping, the idea of a salesperson going from house to house hawking vacuum cleaners or encyclopedia sets feels like a relic from the past. It's highly unlikely you'd ever see one walking the streets nowadays, and equally unlikely that one would knock on your front door. However, if you live in Washington State, you might need to be wary of a certain salesman who is still doing the rounds. SCP-1879, also known as the Indoor Salesman and the Doorman, is a phenomenon that manifests randomly in homes throughout Washington. Subjects will hear persistent knocking from the interior doors of their homes, 
and the affected door becomes classified as SCP-1879-1. The knocking doesn't stop until the door is opened, at which point the subject will be greeted by SCP-1879-2. A Caucasian man of indeterminate age standing around 170 centimeters tall. The man will claim to be a salesman and immediately try to pitch a bizarre product to the subject whose home he's just invaded. The SCP Foundation was first alerted to the existence of the indoor salesman when they had intercepted a 911 call coming from the home of Mrs. Shirley Yates. She had opened the door to her bathroom in an attempt to get the salesman to stop knocking, and once he was in her home, he refused to leave. According to Yates, he kept disappearing in and out of random doors in her house. Foundation Field Agent Rogers was equipped with a recording device and sent in to investigate the case with several other agents. When he arrived at the home, he found Mrs. Yates inconsolable. SCP-1879-2 was still rapidly talking at her, and strangely enough, the product he was holding and trying to sell to her was a Border Collie puppy. As soon as Agent Rogers entered the room, the man shifted his attention away from Mrs. Yates and towards him. He then started trying to sell the puppy to Agent Rogers. Agent Rogers did not want to purchase this puppy, but he found that the man spoke so quickly and urgently, he couldn't get a word in it. If your dad refuses to upgrade from a flip phone clipped to his belt, you've compromised enough. Edgewise, the man was begging Rogers to take the puppy practically shoving it in his face, saying that he didn't need any money, and that the only payment he needed would be some of your time. Rogers grew so annoyed at being talked over and interrupted that he ordered the other field agents to apprehend the indoor salesman. They did so, but as soon as the agents walked him out of the front door of the house, he disappeared without a trace. The agents remained in the area to monitor the situation. SCP-1879-2 manifested again in Mrs. Yates's home six hours later, still trying to trade the puppy for no money, just a little of her time, 12 years to be precise. After hours and hours of being worn down by this supernaturally pushy salesman, Yates relented and agreed to take the puppy, and immediately disappeared. The indoor salesman then disappeared himself through the closet door before he could be apprehended again. At a loss for what to do, the agents administered Class A amnestics to Mrs. Yates's family and left. The reason for her disappearance wasn't fully known until 12 years later in 2015, when she reappeared in the same spot she disappeared from, having no concept of how much time had passed. The puppy really had just cost her 12 years of her life. Stories like that of Shirley Yates have popped up all over the state in the years since, from Everett to Walla Walla and everywhere in between. Due to the random nature of SCP-1879 events and the way the indoor salesman can disappear instantly in and out of any door in a building, the SCP Foundation has been unable to capture him. The best they've been able to do is monitor 911 calls from across the state, listening for key words that might indicate another SCP-1879 infestation. When such an event is reported, the Foundation deploys Mobile Task Force Row 4, aka Shoes Salesman. This task force's entire purpose is to minimize the amount of harm the indoor salesman is able to cause by intercepting him before he can make a sale. This is a very important task, as evidenced by the story of Mrs. Yates, since while the products this salesman sells might be innocent, he doesn't accept payment in any normal currency. The price he asks for his products are always bizarre and often deadly. If all someone loses is 12 years of their life, they could be considered to be getting off easy. In one instance, the product being sold was a single red rose in exchange for the subject's heart. Once the deal was sealed, the subject dropped dead on the spot with an autopsy revealing that his heart and circulatory system vanished from inside his body. In another, the indoor salesman offered 220 bananas and told the subject to simply give him some sugar. The subject agreed, and all candied goods in the home disappeared. In a third, the indoor salesman was trying to sell a thermonuclear warhead, the price of which was the subject's soul. The subject accepted, and at first, nothing seemed to have happened. The Foundation confiscated the warhead and placed it into non-anomalous containment. Later that day, 
the subject went to listen to some music, only to find that two of her vinyl records had gone missing, Lady Soul and Almighty Fire, by world-famous soul singer Aretha Franklin. So, even though he's incredibly invasive, annoying, and his transactions can be deadly, the indoor salesman still maintains a sense of humor. The fact that the foundation can't capture the indoor salesman means that a lot of questions about him remain unanswered. The biggest by far is why he does what he does. In most SCP-1879 events, the indoor salesman seems frantic and desperate to make a sale. Often he will refer to having quotas and deadlines to meet, which implies some other unseen entity that he has to answer to. These questions remain unanswered, because all attempts to interrogate the indoor salesman have been unsuccessful. When he manifests in a location, it's impossible to get him to stray from a sales pitch, and he disappears as soon as he successfully sells his wares. However, there was one instance where, after an SCP-1879 event took place, Foundation agents were there to witness a rare interaction between the indoor salesman and his mysterious employers. Agent Rogers and the rest of the shoes salesman were called out to a home in Spokane, where rapid knocking had begun to emanate from the bedroom door. Equipped with recording devices, Rogers was able to record the voice of the indoor salesman coming from inside the bedroom. In the recording, the salesman grumbled to himself about not being able to meet his quota by tomorrow, saying that if he didn't, he'd be stuck in this world for the next century. He started knocking again, yelling through the door that he knew they were home. He kept knocking until he was interrupted by the sound of a phone ringing. The indoor salesman was heard picking it up, and Rogers managed to record the conversation. The person calling was, apparently, the indoor salesman's boss, who was calling to complain about his performance. Only one side of the conversation was heard, but evidently the indoor salesman's boss wasn't too happy about receiving two Aretha Franklin albums as payment instead of an actual human soul. The indoor salesman apologized for the joke, then told his boss, It won't happen again. Please don't hurt it. I'll meet the quota this time, I swear. He hung up, grumbling to himself again. I better get to move up to at least accounting this time. I've paid my dues and then some. Rogers finally opened the door to the apparent disappointment of the indoor salesman, who was hoping to speak with the home's owner, and was quite annoyed at having another one of his sales interrupted by MTF Row 4. Rogers tried to ask the indoor salesman who he'd just been speaking to on the phone, but as usual, the salesman started talking over him. Now see here, let's think logically, he said. You know I'm not going to tell you anything. Anything. I know you're not likely to buy what I'm selling, so let's just move on to greener pastures. I'm coming up close to a deadline, and I'm sure you're swamped with making sure good people don't lose their jobs, so I'll just be on my way and let you do that. Ciao! The indoor salesman tried to close the door, but Agent Rogers blocked it with his arm. He was tired of this SCP giving him the runaround, and he was going to keep the indoor salesman here if it was the last thing he did. He demanded the entity stay and be interviewed, and other members of the task force apprehended the salesman, making sure he couldn't leave the room. The indoor salesman, now held in place by several armed men, seemed to finally relent. He told Rogers, I'm busy, so I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you something, no money out of your pocket, and we'll call it even. Sound good? Rogers, just wanting to get this whole thing over with, agreed to those terms. Three seconds later, every agent on the scene was dead, and the indoor salesman was able to straighten his tie, pick up his briefcase, and walk through the door to the bathroom. When the bodies of Agent Rogers and the rest of the MTF Row 4 were examined by Foundation scientists, the cause of death was found to be, in every case, thousands of coins suddenly appearing in not only their pockets, but also inside their stomachs, lungs, and even under their skin. Later that day, the indoor salesman was reported at a home in the same neighborhood. He was seen trying to sell the house's owner, 80-year-old retiree Alan Johnson, a Glock 18 pistol in exchange for his attention. As he had done so many times before, the indoor salesman disappeared through another door before the Foundation was able to reach the scene. And when the SCP arrived, they found Mr. Johnson still alive, but now missing his prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that controls attention. It's likely that, because of the nature of the entity, SCP-18 
1979 might be entirely impossible to contain. The Foundation might never find out anything more than what they already know about the indoor salesman, the way he's able to manifest behind closed doors, or the reason he has to keep filling quotas for an unseen boss who apparently doesn't have a very good sense of humor. So, if you're ever in Washington State, be careful who you open your doors to, especially if the knocking you hear is coming from inside your house. But now, if we could have just a few moments of your time, we've got something real special for you. It's SCP-001, which is the real 001. This is a 30 for 1 deal that you can't pass up, so go watch now. Introducing the new Verizon Business Unlimited plans. Get 5G nationwide. Plus, massive data capacity. Plus, mix and match to get more of what you need. All for as low as $30 a line. From Verizon, the network businesses rely on. Like and subscribe right now, or this spider will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. We all know insects suck. They also bite, sting, and kiss. You might think that wild animals are more dangerous than little bugs, but even something as tiny as a fly and a mosquito can cause way more deaths than a vicious beast like a bear. Here we have 10 of the most dangerous bugs in the world. Watch out for the first one, as it'll give you chills like never before. Number 10, Bullet Ant. Starting with the biggest ant in the world, the bullet ant is the bug you definitely need to avoid. This small insect is capable of bites that can trigger an extreme level of pain in the bitten area. The sting from a bullet ant is perhaps the most painful insect sting ever known to humans. The venom-filled sting from a bullet ant would feel like being shot. That's why this deadly ant is named the bullet ant. They're found in the lowland rainforests of Nicaragua, Bolivia, and Paraguay. They mainly inhabit the bases of trees, and bullet ants are also among the largest ants in the world. Their sting is almost 30 times more painful than a honeybee sting, and they use such intensely painful stings solely for their defense. When threatened, no matter whether it's a large animal or a human, bullet ants will sting repeatedly. Their venom causes intense pain, burning, and swelling. Typically, the pain of a bullet ant sting will last for 24 hours. Before we move on, I've got a little challenge for you that'll take five seconds to complete. So here's the deal. You just leave a like on this video, smash that subscribe button, and hit the notification bell, and you'll get 25 years of amazing luck. Try it. It really works. Number nine, bot flies. Could there be anything more disgusting than flies developing under your skin and then eating their way out? The larvae of bot flies are internal parasites of mammals. The young female bot flies lay eggs within the skin of mammals. The larvae penetrate through the skin and lives in subdermal zones of the human skin for more than 60 days, and it can cause dangerous effects to the human body. The patients could feel the movement of larva beneath their skin, and once the larva development gets complete, it leaves out of the body. If you're vacationing south of the U.S. border in Mexico, or down through South America and the rainforests, take precautions and beware of subtle illness after returning home. It's been reported that a person can hear these parasites when the infestations around the neck area. How creepy. Number eight, fleas. Fleas. Fleas are just like people whose opinions differ from yours. In other words, they're small, wingless, blood-sucking insects. They can also infect you with the plague. 
In the 14th century Europe, the Black Plague killed about 25 million people. A flea's life is spent searching for a place to call home, where they can enjoy a meal of sweet, warm blood. They're external parasites that suck blood from humans, birds, reptiles, and wild and domestic animals. Fleas are only the size of the tip of a pen and reproduce very quickly. Every female flea lays 2,000 eggs within their lifespan. Of the 3,000 types of fleas worldwide, only about a dozen are considered harmful to humans, causing plague and or a flea-borne variety of typhus. The most important species are the rat flea, the human flea, and the cat flea. The best way to stave them off is by staying clean and vacuuming your carpets. Keeping a check on your pets if they're itching themselves is very important too. Number 7. Fire Ant Yes, ants can kill you, although it's highly unlikely. They can also inflict extremely painful bites. One of the most painful bites is from fire ants. These little ants build their colonies on the ground in soil and sand very close to your feet. If you're not careful, your feet can be covered in record time and the biting begins before you ever have a chance to get away. They attack and kill small animals. Fire ants only bite to get a grip and then they sting and inject a toxic venom composed of oil alkaloids mixed with small amounts of toxic proteins. The sting, which feels like being burned by fire, typically swells into a bump quickly, which can cause further pain and irritation. Some people either are or become allergic to the venom, sometimes to the point of anaphylactic shock, which can be fatal. Fire ants are very protective of their colonies, and so intruders are given no mercy, so you better watch where you step. Number six, the kissing bug. How sweet. The kissing bug is a bug that gives kisses. However, the name is deceiving because these are not the types of kisses you'd ever want in your lifetime. It's actually a blood-sucking parasite that's attracted to its feeding sites by breath. So if you breathe through your mouth, you're a target. Kissing bugs have a head in the shape of a cone. They're usually light brown to black in color, although some species have red, yellow, or tan markings on their